Welcome to Cloudy with a Chance of Trust, a podcast for digital transformation leaders where we discuss the latest cyber attack issues, enterprise security strategies, and current security events so that you can successfully accelerate network and security transformation. And now here's what's on our mind this week. Hello, everyone, and welcome again to Cloudy with a Chance of Trust. I'm Lisa here with my colleague, Pam, and today we have a special guest, Ira Winkler, author of You Can Stop Stupid and the forthcoming Security Awareness for Dummies, conference speaker, penetration tester, internet security guru for many, many years. Ira, you've been influential in this space basically forever. At a macro level, how do you think cybersecurity has changed in the time you've been addressing it? So at a macro level, people are going to be surprised to hear it, but I don't think it has fundamentally changed. Clearly, the implementations have been different. I think there's a little bit more focus and acknowledgement, frankly, of the importance of cybersecurity, where people are taking it seriously, because before it was primarily a set of tools that people would implement and they would talk to and say it was nice. Then, for example, You know, you started seeing, well, not so ironically, but the first people who really jumped in on this were the major banks, you know, like the Citibanks, the Morgan Stanleys, the JP Morgans, Chases, banks that are not around anymore for for some part of this because of the junk mortgage stuff and everything. But the large banks really seemed to jump in wholeheartedly, realizing that they were losing lots of money because of electronic transactions, realizing that they didn't handle money, they handled computers. And that was their whole business. So they really jumped on first. And then other organizations, because of the nature of crime, quote unquote, going where the money is, people started experiencing losses. They started experiencing a variety of different issues. And they started seeing that security was important to their operations. So that was kind of a healthy realization over a period of time. Mm-hmm. Now, given you know the whole issues with Colonial Pipeline that we just recently had, among others, like just for example, the JMZ, the meatpacking company out of Brazil, you know mm-hmm. that impacted our food production lines and everything. People are really seeing that cybersecurity should be fundamental They're talking to it. Unfortunately, still the large banks are way out in front and taking it seriously. A lot of other organizations, though, are not as out front in embracing how critical it is to their, like they call it critical infrastructure, but at the same time, it's not perceived as critical as you would think, which again is somewhat dismaying, baffling, whatever the word is, but I would say we're at the point where there's a perceived need for security. A lot of people look at it as a set of tools, not what I would phrase as a strategy and a philosophy though. Yeah, you gave a really good RSA keynote along those lines where the human aspects of security are so important, but they aren't really well considered. Is that something you see improving? I gave a talk at the Usenext Security Conference in 1995 where I described social engineering. It was called the seminal work in social engineering. And I gave six ways to prevent social engineering and incorporate security around the humans. And then in 2020 or 2019, towards the end of it, I saw a presentation by somebody who's an expert in social engineering, and they gave their awesome presentation. And they gave pretty much the exact same recommendations I did with the addition of multi-factor authentication that wasn't out there at the time. It is dismaying that nothing regarding the user has changed, you know, for the most part. I say that in a different way. I mean, obviously you're with Zscaler and I think Zscaler is able to move the needle in a lot of ways. And I'll talk about why probably later, but generally people talk about, well, the user makes a mistake. So therefore let's give the user better awareness. Let's have the human firewall. And that is such a fallacy because The user will always make a mistake at the end of the day. Better awareness is a great risk reduction tool. Mm -hmm. People are still relying upon awareness to deal with the quote unquote user problem. When you need a comprehensive solution, just for example, like accounting, they don't just rely upon educating users on how they should implement good accounting procedures. They put systems in place. They put verifications in place. They do a whole variety of things to create a system 
And we're not doing that in cybersecurity with regarding the users. And I'll leave it at that for now. Well, I think you do talk about that also in your book. You can stop stupid. We've been putting this on the shoulders of the users for a long time, but maybe that's a misplaced focus in some ways. Well, it's definitely misplaced. I mean, look at safety science. There was what they call the old school safety science, where if somebody hurt themselves or injured themselves on the job, they would be like, why was that person so stupid that they injured themselves? But what happened was they tried that for a century and then they realized, wait a second, we're losing tens of millions of dollars because somebody hurts themselves on a factory and we have to shut the factory down, as an example. And they had to stop and say, wait a second, They had what they now call new school safety science, where they take a step back and say, well, in the first place, why was that person in a position to injure themselves? And how could we have taken that person out of that position? And once they were in that position, how could we have designed the environment around them to prevent the injury? And then how could we have guided them at the point of decision to not injure themselves and so on? And then if they injure themselves, how can we better mitigate that and maybe stop the injury in progress or at least stop the level of harm it's going to cause? And we're not doing that in the field of cybersecurity in any way, shape or form. We're just saying human firewall, make the users your last line of defense, which is like, what if they're a criminal? You want your criminal to be responsible for your security? That's just stupid. Yikes. You know, you know, Ira, I, I, I have to agree with you on a couple points that you, you really pulled out. I think you hit the nail on the head when you talk about the fact that organizations, a lot of them haven't changed, right? Some, some of them still believe after all these years that everything they've done possible to secure their organizations um, with all the means that they had, right? Which in some instances are putting multiple point solutions in to try to secure them. And yet some of them who, I don't know if it's arrogance or what it is to think that, hey, what I've done is great and no one's going to penetrate this. But you also are coming and touching on the fact that, okay, you users, the users are in a lot of ways, the biggest risk. They're potentially an entry point. And in over the last you know, 18 months, let's face it, the users aren't sitting in those facilities behind all that protection. And you have them multitasking, doing various things, which you can't worry any longer that you've gone ahead and educated them enough. You really have to let the technology protect wherever they are, right? And with all that being said, how do you start to get organizations, these people who don't want to really change, how do you get them to start, stop talking about cybersecurity, about what they're doing as really get the needle moving, right? Really enhance their security posture. How do you see that, us getting them to move? Well, in the first place, there's two things. There's the perception of industry. And frankly, I think the awareness profession itself, the people who handle this most are most responsible for it. You know, you hear the human firewall used on almost a daily basis. You see people writing about it, the leaders in the field talking, oh, human firewall, user's last line of defense. That is a failed strategy. I mean, because the first time it fails, everybody looks at it cynically. In the first place, nobody in cybersecurity actually believes you're going to create a perfect user. You're going to conquer error or whatever it is. So it's just creating a cynicism about it, but there has to be a realization among management. And I'm kind of like, I'm I'm trying to put executives together to realize that you need an engineering approach, an approach that acknowledges that if the user fails in some way, it's a failure of the entire system. It's not a failure of the user and it requires taking responsibility. It requires people understanding that yes, Awareness is a piece of risk reduction with regard to user actions and the overall systems. However, you need to embed security protections around them. You need to envelope the user, for example, around a secure operating environment that limits the exposure of a user to potential initiating damage simultaneously to limiting the damage the user can do. And then also, I think that's the fundamental way I approach it. You know, in the book, You Can't Stop Stupid, I call it human security engineering, where you're essentially trying to say, look, we are engineering security around the user. We're not stopping. And when I say you can't stop stupid, stupid isn't the user. Stupid are the security people who are enabling this. I got the expression from people saying you can't patch stupid. And the actual thing is, yes, you can. 
A patch doesn't mean you stop the error from existing. A patch means that you're mitigating it. And we have to acknowledge that users will be what you refer to, for example, in safety science as the proximity of the loss. It doesn't mean they are the inevitable cause of the loss. And it doesn't matter why they initiate the loss, as I refer to it, as user-initiated loss. It doesn't matter. You just care that you want it to not be initiated. But if it is initiated, you're proactively expecting it. And when we have ransomware, we should expect a user is going to click on ransomware, no matter how funny your awareness videos are. Frankly, no matter how good your anti-malware protection is, something will happen because it'll get through. There's always failures in one way or another. How do you proactively plan for users initiating loss? And if you're not doing that, you are worse than the users. I realize I haven't answered your question, like how are we going to change it? It really is going to take, frankly, a concerted effort for people to realize that the user is just a piece of the system, that you are responsible for securing the whole system. Anyway, Zscaler does work on that because you're creating an operating environment that limits the damage that most users can do with zero trust. So zero trust as a whole is one way to proactively mitigate that. Ira, that's great. <laughs> no, that's great because I think you know you, you've again hit on a key point. Some will say that you have to keep the business running. You have to keep users productive because recently I've heard so many that have gone ahead and gone to mitigate risk from an end user perspective by going always on VPN. Well, I, I've asked those those executives like, well, do you hide? Because your users have to be having a horrible experience, right, with an always on VPN. But in their minds, that's how they're protecting them. Yeah, I mean, I would just quickly say always on VPN is not the answer to the problem. I mean, it's a piece of the problem, but in always on VPN, it doesn't stop, for example, you know, malware that's transmitted via links and so on. It doesn't, you know, like SSL TLS inspection does and all that. I completely agree. It's a false sense of security. Again, it's much like awareness. They implement a specious tactic. They implement a tactic like a strategy. Always on VPN has its benefits as a tactic. Awareness has its benefits as a tactic. You need a comprehensive strategy to implement, to proactively deal with this, I guess is how I would respond. Yes, I agree with you because you see so many that are approaching it tactically and only going ahead and I'm going to solve for this problem I believe I have versus what is the what is the strategic approach I should be taking, which is more platform oriented, right? And I think that's where I see where Zscaler kind of comes in relative to that platform approach with zero trust. Here's how I would phrase the Zscaler benefit. You are building things into the infrastructure. A lot of, you know, there's a lot of vendors that implement zero trust or at least say they do. I mean, frankly, everybody says these days zero trust is somehow embedded and the benefits of zero trust, when you get NSA and Microsoft agreeing, there's definitely <laughs> something to it. But the zero trust is different the way people do, like they'll implement a particular tool and say this tool is providing zero trust. No, the tool provides an aspect of zero trust, which in and of itself might be valuable. Again, Zscaler, essentially, as opposed to taking a tool that's put on top of an infrastructure, essentially is an infrastructure that deploys tools. And I realize that's a high level concept and you people probably can describe it better than I can. But the reason I describe it that way with regard to the end user is that there's an environment. And when I talk human security engineering, before I even looked into you know, zero trust and Zscaler as an example, because I've been working on this a while, you have to look at it from start to finish. Because for example, with a phishing email ransomware, that ransomware doesn't start when a user is looking at it. That ransomware starts on the internet where somebody is out there potentially sending email spoofing somewhere else. And that should be filtered before it gets to the user. Then it gets the email server. And the email server should, again, have its own layers of filtering and content inspection and everything. Then when it finally gets to the email clients, there should be an operating environment that when they look at it, there's some indication. 
Likewise, there's guidance, there's a limitation on what the user can do. And the concept, for example, of least privilege is even if a user clicks on ransomware, the system essentially should stop it from executing or limit what can be ransom because a user should not have the ability to encrypt all the corporate cloud storage systems. And then likewise, when an email message comes into a user, you need SSL, TLS type inspection because a lot of ransomware these days is getting through not because a malicious file gets sent, but because a link to a supposedly trusted service gets sent. And you know they say, oh, Google Drive, got to trust that. And then you click on it and somebody just installed malware on there. You need to inspect it and things like that. It's the operating environment that embraces everything. And you can implement different tactics and tools and all that. Likewise, I can go on to like the exfiltration part, like credentials, like DLP on the outbound side is also critical. But all these things are proactively, I'll use the phrase stopping stupid because it's acknowledging or providing an operating environment that's embedded security throughout from the very beginning of an attack, and I just use ransomware as one case of it, all the way through the realization of the attack. And by having zero trust, you're basically limiting the amount of damage people can do in this regard on so many different levels. So that's a great illustration of how the understanding of zero trust has changed over the past 10 years, because initially when the term was coined, DLP, protection against ransomware, wasn't really in scope for zero trust. And I think what we have had to recognize as applications have moved to the cloud, as users have gone mobile, is it's not just about protecting internal assets. It's not just about protecting on-premise users. We need to be able to have visibility and control over all of that user's traffic, whether it's to a traditional data center-based application, an application that's migrated to or been born in the cloud, private data in a public application, or even communication with truly external sites. And all of these components build towards this transformative security strategy where you're putting in the guardrails and the protections to support the user so that we're not really looking at it anymore as a user failure. We're looking at areas that the system can fail and filling those gaps so that the burden is no longer placed on that user. Would you say that that aligns with how you see zero trust today? I mean, that's exactly how I see it because, you know, frankly, the whole concept of the whole user initiated loss, I mean, we're talking about malicious attacks as examples. The reality, though, is that users essentially are creating more damage on what I call malignancy. In other words, they're just doing their job in a way they might typically do it. And the loss they create is just incidental to doing their jobs in a given way on how they're doing it. So when I see, again, zero trust, it's not just stopping these malicious attacks. It's stopping losses resulting from just systematic, I don't want to call it systematic failures, but we tend to suffer in, in businesses as a whole tend to suffer you know, what you would refer to as death by a thousand cuts. These small little problems eventually add up to major losses, but you never realize it because they're just a small loss at a given time. Zero trust through a variety of means. That is like embedding protections that stop not just ransomware per se, but it stops, again, the accidental deletion of data, the accidental business email compromise where somebody just attaches the wrong sender with a critical data file and so on. All these things are potentially built into a good zero trust architecture that you're going to start to see what I, I've been advocating since 1994 to date myself, that really at the end of the day, good security is only good system administration. And what that means that also encompasses the design of the networks where you're basically just facilitating the infrastructure doing what it's supposed to do, but in a way where security is embedded in everything. As a standard, you know, people shouldn't have to do this, but then do it securely. People should just do their job, which embeds security into it, much like a good infrastructure should have security embedded into it so it's seamless and ubiquitous, and people don't even know they're behaving securely at the end of the day. Absolutely, that's true. 
And now we're also seeing that it's moving beyond the design of the network itself and into the design of the workflows and the communication paths and the controls that are in place so that we are no longer bound to the design of the network, but we can really focus on the important things, who is doing what, what they need to be doing, how we can let them do it as seamlessly as possible. I would completely agree. And I think that's where, you know, a, your comment about stopping loss from systematic failures, you know, whether it's accidental or malicious, if you remove the user out of the equation in having to make a decision and you go to that full zero trust, the true definition, right, of zero trust, because so many have altered it to either match their technology they're offering or have made it, molded it to be what they need it to be so they can say they're at zero trust, right? They've implemented zero trust. I think it's very interesting, your whole approach. And this has been a great conversation. I thank you so much, Ira. If, if there's anything you want to leave our listeners with, one last thought, what would it be? In a purely biased sense, they should all buy You Can Stop Stupid because it discusses this and more. But, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I'm biased, but it's, I think it's also true. But at the very nature of things, I really wish people would see, again, that a, a user failing, and frankly, any failing by the system, by a component of their network architecture or whatever it is, is a failure of the whole system. Unfortunately, from the user perspective, we try to attach for example, if, an, if a router is set up insecurely, they're like, you know, a good organization will say, how do we define a good configuration tool? How do we harden this? Why wasn't it hardened? And so on. And then maybe why was the network? Look at the network infrastructure as a whole. We got to adopt those type of principles for the user, but simultaneously acknowledge that our users are never going to be perfect and we have to expect failure. And I don't say that in a bad way. I just say that much in the way that you are driving and you're driving and expecting other users to fail by expecting other drivers on the road to fail, essentially, you can drive more safely. By expecting user, your car, for example, to fail at some point, you do good maintenance and you watch your monitor lights to see if low fluids are there. That's acknowledging failure will exist. We have to do that with the users and not portray them as some paragon of virtue that we could make to be a perfect entity. I would try to lead people with that. And it's okay that users aren't perfect. And we acknowledge that and build that in because they're not, they're not meant to be. And we have to stop advocating this insanity. I'll leave it there. That's great. And, you know, with that, I thank you so much, Lisa and I, we've been truly enjoyed having you come and visit with us and chat. And for everybody listening, please go out, get You Can Stop Stupid, see how it will affect you and your organizations and enhance it. So thank you so much. And we look forward to talking to you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Cloudy with a Chance of Trust. Check back with your podcast provider regularly for more episodes. You can find Lisa Lorenzen and Pam Kubiatowski on the CXO Revolutionaries website at revolutionaries.zscaler.com or on LinkedIn. Statements by Zscaler podcasters and guests are informational only and should never be construed as legal advice. You should consult with your legal advisor on matters related to you or your business. Zscaler makes no warranties, express, implied, or statutory as to the content of this podcast, and it is provided as is. Content on this podcast may contain forward-looking statements that are current as of the date of recording and subject to change. These statements are subject to the safe harbor provisions created by the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Full legal disclaimers are available at revolutionaries.zscaler.com. Copyright 2021.